I'm gonna get started now. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, uh, my name is Gabriella Ortega Ricketts and I'm IDA's manager of artist programs. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm speaking today from Hi the Highland Park neighborhood in Los Angeles, uh, belonging to, still inhabited by and cared for by the Gabriela Nortongva people. Uh, I am a light-skinned Colombian American woman with kind of a messy brown bob and bangs. I am wearing gold-rimmed glasses and a red mock neck shirt with white stripes. Behind me is a white wall with a colorful poster of uh, the passion of Joan of Arc. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank all of our uh, access providers, Tina, who's doing cart captioning, and Mara and Darcy, who are our ASL interpreters. Um, as a reminder, you can turn captions on, uh, which you can do so by clicking, I think, more and then captions, and then you should have an option to turn them on if you need them. Uh, I also have a few announcements about upcoming events. We have um, a seminar from our nonfiction access initiative, Embodied Infrastructure Disabled Immersive Nonfiction. And uh, I will put that link in the chat if you wanted to sign up. And then we also have the second part of our uh, uh, accessibility and disability justice teach out. And this is only. Uh, for those who identify as disabled. Um, and then again, uh, we also have a nonfiction access initiative survey. And if you uh, fill it out, um, you can get a doc lover membership um, once you submit your responses, complimentary. Um, our awards are open and our getting real dates for 2024 have been locked. And you can check all of that out on our website. Um, and we're so excited that you're here. We deeply appreciate our diverse global membership body. And um, we're so grateful to have some of you here with us. Um, it's because of uh, our members like you that we are able to do what we do. Um, and if you enjoy this event and you are not a member, oh, here's my cat. <laughs> Uh, and if you're not a member, um, uh, you know, please consider becoming one. Um, and if you are a member, or if you become a member, or if you are a member, there are some uh, Getty perks, which, sorry about that, which um, Anissa, my colleague, will post in the chat. Um, anyway, that's that spiel. So I have been working about this event. I have been working in the documentary field since 2015 uh, as an archival producer, associate producer, kind of across the spectrum. And I have seen, you know, firsthand the impact of, uh, you know, the difficulties of our archival licensing on um, independent filmmakers and kind of all of the politics and, and difficulties within that from rising costs to just difficulty accessing material. Um, and I really wanted to put this uh, event on to have kind of, or begin the conversation around these issues um, in a more public setting. So uh, I'm very excited for today. Um, and I wanted to introduce our moderator and panelists. So Charlie Shackleton will be moderating the session and Charlie is a nonfiction filmmaker living and working in London. His work has screened at festivals, including uh, Sundance and South by, South, South by Southwest, and has won awards, including uh, a British Independent Film Award and a Grierson. His latest film, The Afterlight, exists as a single 35 millimeter print, which has toured continually since its premiere in 2021. His one-on-one -on -one performance piece as Mine Exactly, won the Immersive Art and XR Award at the 2022 BFI London Film Festival. And we are very excited to have him here today, uh, all the way from London. Uh, then we have Emma Simpson, 
who is one of our wonderful panelists from Journeyman Films, which is a great archive. Um, Emma started her career in factual distribution as the head of footage department at Journeyman Pictures in 2009. Since then, Emma has worked in all areas of distribution under the Journeyman roof, from footage to news, and documentary sales and acquisitions. Today, Emma co-runs the company with a particular focus on acquiring new documentary projects and working on their global release strategies. Then we have Ruda, who's joining us from Athens, Georgia. Uh, Ruda is the director and, sorry, Ruda is the director of the Walter J. Brown Media Archives and Peabody Awards Collection at the University of Georgia Libraries. She has worked in moving image archives for the past 30 years, and she is cur she currently manages a collection of over 350,000 analog visual audiovisual items and over 200,000 digital files with collections ranging from local news content to home videos to the Peabody Awards. She is a past board member of Cine, a, a nonprofit cinema and art space located in downtown Athens, Georgia. She recently completed a chapter on the history of the Peabody Awards collection for a book tentatively titled The Archivability of Television, edited by Lauren Bratzlovsky and Elizabeth Peterson, that will be published by the UGA later this year. She has a BFA in filmmaking, an MA in popular culture, and an MA in library and information studies. And last but not least, we have Salvatore joining us from New York, I believe. Um, who is from Getty, Getty Images. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Salvatore Body's background crosses traditional disciplinary lines between programming, archival work, and filmmaking. After working in short form Super 8, Super 8 millimeter and 16 millimeter for many years, Salvatore completed his first feature film, Dreams of Her, which had its world premiere at the 2001 South by Southwest Film Festival. A graduate of Vassar College, Salvatore has worked as a historical film programmer for Austin Film Society, taught film history, and been published in a number of publications. In 2024, he completed work on his second feature film, The Future Past. Salvatore has over 20 years of experience in footage licensing, having spent the last seven years with Getty Images as a broadcast archive specialist. He currently manages a team who specialize in NBC, BBC, ITN, and TVNZ archive licensing. Thank you so much, all of you for being here. Um, I am really excited again for this conversation. I keep saying it. Um, and Charlie, I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Charlie Shackleton. Uh, I'm gonna briefly describe uh, my background as well. Uh, literally. Um, I'm a 30-year-old uh, uh, white man with blonde hair wearing clear plastic glasses and a purple t-shirt. Um, and I'm sitting in front of quite a huge amount of stuff, uh, but notable objects include a printer, uh, some poster tubes, and a number of different plants. Um, and, and maybe as I, I come to each of our uh, panelists, I'll get them to do the same. Um, so yeah, thank you for being here, everyone. Um, I am a, a filmmaker myself who has worked a lot with Archive, um, and I feel like these kinds of conversations between filmmakers and uh, those responsible uh, for archives and uh, archive houses are all too rare. So it's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here today having one of those. Um, and I think by by way of introductions, I, I might just go around the room and get each of our panelists to talk a little bit about their institutions. Um, and specifically, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from everyone how they see their organization fitting into the larger field of archival uh, film. Uh, and audiovisual material, um, not just in in kind of lofty in terms of lofty ideals, but also like the practical reality. Like, what do you think your institution is good at? What is it maybe not so good at? Um, where does it slot into everything else? Um, so maybe we'll start uh, with you, Sal. Uh, given that that Getty obviously is uh, 
by far the, the biggest institution in the room, if not the world, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you take over. Okay. Hey everyone, Salvatore Body. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm wearing a light reddish shirt, collar, um, sort of shortish brown hair. Uh, I'm sitting here in Brooklyn, New York, but you would never know it because I have a Getty backdrop, which is comprised of a sort of montage of archival photographs um, throughout history. Um, and thank you all for having me. True honor and pleasure to be here. Um, so yes, I work at Getty Images. Uh, in a nutshell, Getty Images is a commercial licensor, um, a photography, video, and music, um, offering a growing library of over 534 million visual assets that truly deliver you know, unmatched depth, breadth, and quality. And all of this is underpinned by a base of exclusive content that can only be found at Getty Images. Um, to kind of follow up on Charlie's question in terms of, you know, archive and the role that Getty plays in um, filmmakers' access to archive, I'd like to think that we very much, um, you know, want to be an integral component uh, of that. Um, we we very much, you know, we have so many different partners and contributors and collections. And I think one thing on this call that I'd like to kind of message is that, you know, we very much on a, from a broadcast team standpoint, we do have a newly formed broadcast team that specifically serves the film and TV production community. Um, and with that team, we really kind of want to engage and partner with you on your stories. Um, and for me, you know, in a nutshell, I referenced this on an earlier call with the team is, you know, from my vantage point, you know, story is emotion, emotion is connection, you know, and connection is audience and audience equals project success. So I think, you know, one of the challenges that we have um, is we have, we truly have so many archives and so much to offer and so much content that it can be overwhelming in terms of how to access that, access all of those materials. And kind of going back to this point of story and engaging and collaborating with filmmakers, I think it's so paramount to be part of the journey with you. Um, I know there may be first time filmmakers on this call, there may be veteran filmmakers. I think it's, I think really kind of understanding the story and also the resources that you have at that particular moment in time because I like to think that the broadcast team in that we specialize in this community um, we're very keen to what's going on in the market and we're also very sensitive I like to, to think to particular filmmaker situations so certainly you may be starting on a project and have little to no budget you know, what can we provide to you at that immediate moment in time? You know, what resources are available to us? Um, what story are you telling? You know, um, we love detail, like the more detail that you can provide to us. And forgive me, I know I'm sounding a little bit like a car salesman here, but just trying to kind of frame out how, you know, sort of like the best methods and practices to interact with us and engage with us in order to provide you with as many tools and resources to tell your stories in the most profound manner possible. Um, and I think really fundamentally that's that's what it's all about. Um, I, you know, to kind of the last thing I'll say, Charlie, just, you know, you mentioned around like things we can do better, things maybe that we can improve upon. Um, and I, I do think it really kind of points to communication and engagement with filmmakers. Um, I've been on many projects and correspondences, probably with many of you on the call today, whereby, you know, we're not getting the full picture as to, you know, what's going on in your world. And maybe you might, you know, you might kind of receive um, a pricing quote or, or something along those lines that, you know, might make you averse to working with us because you're just, it might just feel beyond your means. And that's that's the dynamic and the narrative that we very much want to transcend within the filmmaking community and january 1 of this year you know we 
um, broadcast management, you know, we, we very much collectively wanted to make it our mission to engage with the filmmaking, filmmaking community. So big and small, whatever project you're working on, allow us to kind of engage with you and partner with you on the entire production life cycle, because the story that maybe you're intending to tell today may change tomorrow. So again, I just kind of wanted to um, to relay those those points home. Sorry if I was a little long winded there. No, no, not at all. Thank you. Um, yeah, lots to come back to there, but I'll I'll keep uh, working around the room for now, and then we'll return. And I, I should say, uh, if anyone watching has any questions, please do put them in the chat throughout the conversation. Uh, we're going to be coming to them a little bit later in the session, but they will all be read and uh, collated and make their way back to the room, hopefully. Um, so Emma, perhaps you could talk next about, about the function of, of the archive within Journeyman um, and how it differs, obviously, from, a, from an archive on the scale of something like Getty. Yeah, absolutely. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for having us here today. We're really pleased to be taking part. Um, just to um, begin with a brief description, I am um, a female um, with white skin, fair skin, with fair hair. Um, I don't know how much you can actually see. I've got a blue, dark blue jacket on and a white top. And behind me, you can see a um, white poster image of Journeyman Pictures with um, the Journeyman Pictures text and our logo with the globe image, which is made up of individual posters from the film to represent, as well as a, um, next to me, I have a big uh, plant. Um, so it's Journeyman Pictures, we, um, wear different hats in the industry. We are a documentary distribution company, first and foremost, um, but we've been a company since the early 1990s. And since that time, um, we have also had an archive and we have licensed footage. And today we have a very extensive library of material that we license to people for archival use. Um, we have over 9,000 films that's made up of feature length documentaries down to short reports and um, out of those we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of clips that we license. Um, we have a direct footage platform website, journeymanfootage.tv. Um, I think what we're probably known most for is um, socio-political, environmental material, um, journalistic material first and foremost. Um, we have particularly an extensive archive from regions like Africa and the Middle East. But that said, we have a very diverse archive and we also have a lot of history, music, art. So we're, we're pretty eclectic. Um, we obviously are a very different beast to um, Getty in that we're um, a small boutique independent company, significantly smaller team. Um, and we are at heart a, a small indie outfit as much as we have a broad global reach. Um, so in that sense, we are a slightly different um, organization. Thank you. Um, and yeah, finally, we'll, uh, we'll come to you, Ruta. And if you could talk a bit about um, working within a, a university archive and, and how, again, that would differ from the two examples we've had. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. I will do a brief description. Um, my name is Ruta Abelins, and I use um, female pronouns, she, her, hers. I am a light-skinned female with, I'm wearing a black shirt and dark eyeglasses that are square. I'm sitting in front of a window. It's a nice day outside. And um, there are file cabinets uh, behind me and some nice colorful artwork. I am at a university, so our mandate is very different um, than the other two um, licensors who are talking today. So our primary focus is the University of Georgia and working with um, faculty and students. 
uh, and collecting materials from the region and from the state. Um, and of course, housing the Peabody Awards after the award cycle every year. So we have, a, even though we're regionally focused in one direction, our, our um, holdings are really diverse. Um, and I would say one of our strengths is the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, that is something um, that a lot of folks will come to us for. Um, I will say that the other thing that's really important to us is just collecting materials and collecting materials um, from the region and from the state. And, and that's incredibly important because there isn't another archive like ours in, in the area really that does what we do. Um, so we have six television stations from across the state, for example. But there's also interest in the content that appears in the Peabody Awards collection, especially the earlier years. A lot of um, times folks didn't save that content, but they sent it in for an award, for example, from a local television station, and they didn't save it. So we have it, we share it for research purposes, and then if someone is interested in licensing it, we can't license that material, but we can tell them to go to the licensor and we will provide content for a lab fee, for example. But we license um, primarily our news content, but we also have home movies and a variety of other things um, that we can license. And that, that licensing aspect, how, how do you see that fitting into the sort of core mission of the, of the archive, if, as you say, it's, it's primarily about serving the university and the faculty? Yeah, it is, but... Um... As Sal um, can probably tell you, and I'm sure Emma can as well, it's expensive to have an archive, to have physical holdings like we have and keep them safe um, and in good condition, but also to hold digital files. Um, I know, you know, I, I think there's a misnomer that, you know, oh, digital files, it's in the cloud, whatever. Well, Somebody's always paying for that. Somebody's always increasing the storage. There's also, and this is really important, making sure that the files are lasting, that there isn't any bit rot or anything like that, and making sure that these files are QC'd. So um, that's a whole component part of it. And so being in a public institution where we have this tremendous collection, it's huge, and we have digital files and we have the storage, we, part of what we're doing by licensing is helping support what it is we do. It takes a great burden off of our, our administration not to have to support every single thing that we do. So the fact that we can buy more digital storage or fix broken equipment, for example, a uh, legacy equipment or buy a new scanner. I mean, that's, you know, that's something that we can do with licensing. So it's a self-supporting thing, um, which is really helpful for, you know, our organization as a whole. And on that, that subject of, uh, of money, um, I know one of the things that's come up a lot in discussions around this panel is, is rising costs around licensing. Um, and I suppose this is a question for all of you, but, but maybe we'll go to Emma first. Um, as a smaller uh, organization, I imagine more susceptible to, to the rising cost of, of everything. Um, is there a feeling that, that that cost inevitably needs to be kind of passed on and, and borne by the licensor or the licensee, rather? Um. I'd say, I mean, actually, we've almost found the opposite in that, um, you know, when I first started working at the footage department here, every time somebody wanted to screen some of our clips, we had to burn them to a disc and then ship the disc to them. And it was very cost effective and labor intensive. And absolutely, um, what Rucha was saying is has, is very true. And we felt that extremely deeply as an independent company the shift we had to do from having everything on tape 
to digitizing everything, you know, for a little independent outfit to digitize over 9,000 films and not only retain those tapes, but also have backups and as well offer digital resources was a tremendous cost that put a huge burden on the company. But now that we have almost entirely achieved that aim, which has taken many years of gradually chipping away at that, now the costs for us to run our archival system are actually significantly cheaper because now we have a digital, of course there's maintenance costs, of course we have to still have resources, but now that things are predominantly digitized, for us to make things accessible to our, our clients who come to us is much, much easier. So we haven't personally had a knock-on effect in terms of our rates. If anything, um, our rates have been stagnant for a long time, which we probably should review. But it's, um, you know, part of our mission that we want to be. Don't let this panel encourage you to do that. <laughs> That's the opposite intention. No, I'm realizing it was a <laughs> trick. Um, no, the, you know, we, it, part of Journeyman Pictures' um, aims is to be, you know, we work very collaborative, collaboratively with filmmakers in many different ways. So for us, the costs have stayed more or less the same as they were 15 years ago, actually. But yes, it, we have had significant burden to stay alive as an archive and to still be here and be accessible to people. That's been a huge burden on us. Yeah, and I mean, in fact, I'd like to come back to something you mentioned earlier, Sal, uh, related to that. Um, it would seem just in a kind of common sense way that it that it would be much easier for organizations like Emma and Reuters to have these sorts of personal relationships because they're on a such such a smaller scale. Um, you mentioned one of the things that people could find alienating about working with Getty could be that, you know, they send like a unsolicited message into the void they get back a standard rate card mm. and they can't afford it or whatever else it might be the problem and it just feels like a kind of um mm -hmm. you know faceless organization um i know you're you're working to counter that now but is there a risk that it it therefore falls into sort of two tiers like the people who have a connection to someone at the organization and the people who don't how, how do you make sure that 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 brings everyone in. Yeah, I mean, I would say for everyone on this call, you know, I think um, Anissa may have posted it, but you know, we do have a specific Getty email that everyone can utilize, um, which goes to three individuals. So that will be ring fenced. You know, I am on that communication. Um, but you bring up a valid point, Charlie, in that you know we have many conduits for customers to contact us. I would say that you know many of the conversations that we have as a group is how to ring fence these particular production uh, accounts and these filmmakers. And when I see when I say ring fence, it's devising a process to uh, handle some project discovery, employ some project discovery, get some understanding of what they're seeking, you know, are they a film and TV production? Or are they a corporate client? And funneling those to the aforementioned broadcast team. So we are definitely trying to kind of put, um, you know, processes in place to, you know, avoid those, those situations where a customer, you know, may not, we may not be able to engage with a customer on the level I think that production clients really require because rights can be so nuanced, um, projects can be so nuanced, content can be so nuanced. And it's really about like getting people connected with the experts. Uh, you know, I know that sounds overly simplistic, but, you know, and that expert isn't necessarily just me. You know, we have obviously Getty has a lot of resources. We're consistently mining all of our various archives, Bettman, Holton, Sigma, BBC, you know, ITN, TVNZ, NBC. Um, so, you know, I would just, I would just say that, you know, that's something that we are actively trying to address and like really trying to kind of um, create a better customer experience. And, you know, I will say I'm on what feels like, you know, an infinite amount of meetings throughout the week. And I would estimate that, you know, 65 to 70% of the, you know, of the dialogue in those conversations 
does directly relate to customer experience, reducing process friction, reducing licensing difficulty. And again, kind of going back to story, um, trying to kind of, you know, be a comprehensive um, library um, for, for their content needs. Yeah, and, and without uh, wishing to turn this into a, a, a customer support helpline, uh, if anyone watching has had specific experiences with, with any of the archives we're talking about, please do um, include that in the, in the comments and in the questions, and, and we'll come to it at the end. I see there's one that's just appeared in the chat, which we will no doubt come to later. Um, Ruta, something, something you mentioned earlier about um, sort of the, the creation of the archive and, and the mission of the archive, which obviously, uh, unlike uh, Emma and, and Sal's, uh, is not designed to make profit. It, it's within a, an educational environment. Um, you know, you, you spoke about that, obviously, in, in fairly... Um, in terms of principles and, and ideals um, and the value of, of the various uh, collections that are within the archive. But of course, then you also spoke about the, the pragmatic reality of, of keeping it financially viable and having uh, revenue from, from licensing. To what extent do those two things feel in conflict to you? And, and when they do, how do you resolve that conflict as as kind of a a steward of of this very culturally valuable material but but also inevitably a, a gatekeeper of it mm -hmm. um th that's you know that's a great question because i've i've felt conflicted <laughs> many 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 times um i will say that because we're at an educational institution the education always comes first so if um, not all of our stuff is digitized at all, but we do have records for it online so people can find it. And if somebody finds something they want to see, we will digitize it at no charge, put it online. It will have a watermark and time code on it, but it's there for research purposes. And so for us, that's sort of one of the key things about the collection is being able to access it and being able to at least watch it. Now, one of the benefits of, uh, of doing it that way is that it serves our researchers or students or faculty, but it also serves um, producers um, because they can, they can see the content as well. Uh, and I like that. I like being able to do that in sort of one fell swoop. Um, the other thing about, about this, is um, just remembering our mission all the time. You know, our mission is the first thing I have to think of. So we're really here to preserve content of the people of, of the state of Georgia, but also the history of broadcasting. So when I put it in that context, and it has to be what I think about every time I come to my job is, okay, this is our mission. This is what we're here for. And these are the priorities. So I prioritize in that way, but I still have to go back to, we've got a rush order somebody wants from a producer uh, I, and I need to get that money in. So if it were a choice between a student needing something for a class and the producer, I got to pick the student, but I will darn sure try and get that producer's content out the door as quick as I can. I mean, that's, that's sort of how it goes. It's an, it's a constant for us. It's like this all the time. And it's great that you picked up on that. I appreciate it. Well, I'm sure it's something that the, the filmmakers watching can relate to as well. Uh, certainly these sorts of ethical quandaries over uh, principle versus pragmatism are, are not limited to the archive sphere. Um, to, to stay on that, um, I, I saw someone mention it in the chat. It, it was something that I had intended to, to mention myself. Um, a recent film by uh, the British filmmaker, Richard Misek, uh, which is called A History of the World According to Getty Images. Um, although I think the questions it poses, uh, I would be interested to hear all of you talk about, not just Sal. Um, it's, for those who haven't seen it, it's a kind of uh, provocative uh, work dealing with lots of different aspects of uh, image archiving and licensing 
Um, but one of its central concerns is the lack of availability uh, of a lot of public domain audiovisual material. Um, I think as Misek uh, refers to it in the film, uh, he talks about a wealth of material being in the public domain, but not in the public realm, because it's still, for the most part, held behind paywalls within uh, image archives. Um, and he proposes, uh, among other potential solutions, that that uh, archives such as Getty could commit to making uh, at least a proportion, if not the entirety of their public domain material freely available um, in the interests, essentially, of kind of honoring a social contract, um, as he sees it, uh, that by being the stewards of this collectively owned material, um, they might also be responsible for making it available to the collective. Um, so I, I would love, uh, Sal, to, to hear your, your thoughts on that. I know you can't speak uh, for, for Getty at large, um, but in terms of that specific proposal and more broadly the, the question of, of what it is to be both a steward and, yeah. you know, commercial gatekeeper yeah i mean so a few responses i would say that um we 100 percent have content within many of our various collections that are that is in the public domain um but kind of going back to our license and our our end user license agreement our tv tv and film writers is you know, I've worked on thousands of projects through the years, um, and I can say around 10 to 15% of those projects have been clients coming to us after their edit has locked and trying to backsource material, trying to kind of, you know, identify rights after the fact. Um, on the PD front, I mean, if filmmakers should feel, I mean, I'm 100% in support of public domain material being accessible and viewable to to a wider audience, and I think like with websites like archive.org, that's that's definitely happened. Um, you know, from our side, we are we are a licensor. You know, we are a business, um, but specifically, what we are affording productions, customers, clients is a license which indemnifies you for the copyright to clip image and also provide you with a agreement for when you do sell your film that you know we're not attorneys we're not lawyers so we we don't give legal advice but it provides you with an ironclad um you know agreement for when you do actually secure distribution to for your films that inevitably many of these distributors will ask for um if if you want to go the public domain route and you know include this content in your film i mean that's obviously 100 percent everyone's right right to do so um you're probably saying like well you control the high res you know you control the mastering and and all that you know and and i get it it's it's a heavy responsibility and a, a huge endeavor to make a film um and i know there's not only financial challenges, there's creative challenges, um, there's rights challenges, there's there's so much that goes into it. And, and we you know, I, I completely understand that and get it. Um, but I do think just again, filtering it through all of the experiences that I've had, which have been so stressful for filmmakers because in many instances they actually have to go back into edit, you know, which means like money towards the studio, onlining again color correcting because they've had to actually revise their their particular projects in you know whatever way shape and form so you know i just i just would say to that um partnering with us earlier you know helps avoid some of these situations as far as the other kind of messaging of that film which is you know pricing i know there's that like big moment in the film where it kind of is like this content would cost you know sixty thousand dollars or something like that um you know that 
I can't say how, if that was, but it's probably just, you know, someone or I don't know, but utilizing our rights calculator, just pricing those all out by the clip, we do offer bulk discounting for for film and TV projects. Like we 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 do negotiate. Like again, kind of going back to, you know, like what is what are you know what is your budget? You know what what will your budget allow? Um, and you know, kind of working with us to be like, okay, you know, maybe this is the threshold. Like maybe this is the sweet spot where we'd like to kind of stay. Um, but I guess to the larger point around like public domain content, you know, making it kind of free and accessible to everyone, kind of back to Ruta's point, like it's just not in terms of managing these archives and like, and it's not just like files, it's like metadata, it's cataloging, it's, you know, all of that that goes into it, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's the reality of, um, of, you know, sometimes of licensing. And I suspect that some of this may come down to a, a different conception of what an archive is, or or rather warring overlapping conceptions of what an mm -hmm. archive is. You know, you referred to, to Getty as a, a licensor, and obviously in a commercial sense, that is its uh, primary function and primary source of income, uh, I imagine. Um, whereas I imagine uh, the, the filmmaker of that film would conceive of it equally if not more so as as this kind of de facto custodian because of its scale because of its significance um so maybe maybe we'll come back to some of that but actually I'd, I'd be interested to hear you talk Emma about um about that same kind of um set of warring impulses because I I imagine in the case of journeyman um which I believe at least in part is licensing material produced by the production and distribution side of journeyman is that correct yes i mean we're not a production house ourselves but we um license footage that um most times has come from a documentary or a news report that we are selling as a as a whole right. um so and so a yeah. more kind of intimate connection than most archives I would imagine to the material that you're licensing um I wonder if you could talk about how that impacts your conception of of what it is that you're kind of preserving and making available and selling and and how those different impulses overlap yeah absolutely I mean we are coming at archive from a slightly different position as I said at the start because of where our archive comes from um and so for us there's always this balancing act between wanting to make our library as accessible as possible um for filmmakers to use it as a resource equally being aware of the the, the origins of the footage that we're we're licensing out and oftentimes you know knowing personally the person who actually went out with their camera and shot that footage and oftentimes knowing exactly what went into that um and so for us there's always got to be a balance between making that material available but equally honoring the work that's gone into filming that material um so that just has to be a balance it does mean i think because of um the fact that we are a bit more boutique that that's often an open dialogue you know sometimes we will go back to the filmmaker and say this project has come along they're really interested in your material that you shot in Afghanistan um they're working to a really tight budget this is the maximum they can afford to pay these are the rights they want what do you think and sometimes we will open those channels of dialogue um generally speaking we try and avoid that because we obviously don't want to put the burden back onto the filmmaker but there will be occasions where it, it's warranted um and and so with that it, it's difficult and like sal says you know um every time we we make clips from a, a film that we're representing where the filmmaker has agreed for us to to license clips from their their films that's a huge endeavor on its own to you know potentially one documentary could procure thousands of clips and each one has has to be catalogued has to have the metadata organized so that has to be reflected somehow 
in how we then license that material. I don't know if that really is answering your question, but it's, I guess, where's the, my point is that we, yeah, we come to archive from a slightly different context, I suppose. Yeah, totally. And, and I want, like, I'm intrigued whether you, although perhaps more so than, than say, Ruta's work, your um, primary short-term intention with all of the material that you're collecting is licensing. Uh, is there also a, a conception of, of the journeyman archive as, you know, a kind of archive in, in a more um, abstract long-term sense and, and what, what is being built as a, as a cultural collection? Absolutely. And um, that's a real ambition for us. And again, it comes down to how we promote that. And um, so people are aware that that's a resource. But I think because of the roots of the material, um, the fact that there's a huge volume of independent journalism in our archive, um, journalists who were the only people who were on site at a massacre, for example, and they've got the only footage that was ever shot of that massacre, and it's sitting in our archive you know, just as an example, like for people to understand that as an educational resource, um, as a piece of history, that the journeyman archive is totally bespoke and, and in that sense, quite unique. And um, for it to exist and have a, a life beyond journeyman pictures is really important to us. Um, it's just how we make as many people as possible aware that it exists really. Um, because I think the Journeyman Pictures brand as a documentary distributor um, often, you know, outstrips the branding we have for the Journeyman footage, which exists as a quite a separate entity. Um, and 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 Ruta, uh, so that I'm not uh, putting uh, all of uh, that film's uh, provocations on Sal, um, I would imagine there is public domain material in your archive as well. Um, perhaps not quite as much. Um, is that a question that, that you have posed before? Um, there, there is some public domain material, particularly um, in the Peabody Awards collection, um, but I, I'm gonna go back to this because it's a, a really important point and Sal mentioned it and, and so did Emma, and that is there is, there is a cost to what we do. And this description and time, time to describe, time to discover, time to digitize, time to preserve digital files, all of it. If I've got to send something to a lab because it needs special work, um, there's just a cost. There's an innate cost to what we do. Um, but that said, you know, I've definitely negotiated with filmmakers, I do it all of the time. I think in some ways, because um, I'm at a smaller institution, it's easier in a way. Um, and I'm also happy to say that we do do some pro bono work um, with productions every year. So this year it's a podcast that's actually based in Athens and it's another, it's a project in Atlanta that's gonna be happening that we're, we're doing. Well, actually there's two Atlanta projects we're doing pro bono. And so that's kind of our giving back. And in particular, giving back to Georgia, um, with these filmmakers or podcasters from the area and we choose to do pro bono work every year for something and I'm, I'm really glad that we're able to do that um, but we do choose to do a few projects every year now can I go beyond that maybe in the future just depending I, I, I'm not opposed to that at all but we have stuck with with Georgia because that's you know that's our home base um, and there was something else I wanted to say um, we work, we have quite a few collections from documentary filmmakers, and I'm really glad that we have um, that content because I think it's documentary filmmakers that often need, and Emma can probably address that, need a home base for their stuff. Um, they need a place for it to go to live long term. Um, and but I will say when when working with um, documentary filmmakers or anyone who's interested in donating a, co a collection, we will have a discussion about licensing rights. Is this something we can split licensing rights on? Is this something you don't want to do that with? And then what does that mean? Because we offer a lot, as I said, a value add 
for folks that work with us, and that's digitization and description and housing the, the content long term below ground. You know, it's it, it, there's a lot of value add behind the scenes. We're going to open it up to uh, to the questions very shortly. Uh, one final thing I thought I'd I'd ask before that is, I'm sure people are going to have a lot of questions about uh, their experience working with with archives. Um, but I'm intrigued uh, from you three, what your experience has been like working with filmmakers, and specifically, if there's anything that would be you think helpful in your relationship with filmmakers that, that people don't tend to tell you or show you or give you. Um, Sal, you, you mentioned some stuff around this uh, relating to, you know, people coming to you as early as possible in the process and, and being mm -hmm. transparent about what their financial situation is. Um, is there, so in fact, maybe I'll, I'll start with you and you can, you can build on that and then we'll go around. Yeah, you know, I don't mean to kind of harp on like the big like story narrative that I'm pushing here, but I think so much of it really ties to that because it's not just like, okay, you know, I'm making a documentary on X topic or event, you know, it's like, what is the tenor of your piece? Like, what is the specific sequence that you're working on about? Um, I frequently watch a lot of the films that I work on and I'm like, oh, damn, I wish I would have known more about this particular section of their film because like we have this content, we have this content or this content became newly available to us. Um, so if I were to kind of, you know, encapsulate like one really critical piece, it's sharing with us all of that detail. Um, and I know that detail is going to evolve, you know, from a pre-production standpoint, hey, just exploring right now, looking for everything that's out there. Um, we have a lot of tools and resources that we can provide to you, you know, in a very general sense. Um, but as you're editing, maybe you're editing sizzle reels to get to get some funding and, and applying for grants and things like that. And you really kind of intuitively start to find yourself being married to certain pieces of content and archive. Like, let us know that maybe we have more, maybe we can mine further. Um, it's, you know, for me, it's, I know I don't, you know, I know this is gonna sound very general, but I work in the offline video space. So I license from, we license from like broadcast archive, which I'm sure many of you on this call are like, OMG, that's like so complicated, but it's like the cascading layer of like, not only identifying copyright, securing editorial approvals, it's, it's a huge dance and we love it. But what I was going to say was, for me, it's very much about like establishing rhythm and processes with, with filmmakers and customers. And I think once you kind of lay that foundation at the onset of a project, one, you, you know, as you kind of embark on your journeys, like you strengthen your relationship with, with a sales rep or a product specialist, and you kind of allow them, you know, insight into kind of what's going on with your particular projects. And it kind of like, it's like, it just, you know, it just, I just feel that like, when I watch certain films, granted, I'm not the creator and I certainly don't claim to kind of be, you know, editor, director, writer or any, but there's a great feeling of, you know, contributing archive to these productions and, and enhancing your stories. But I guess, again, I'm being a little fragmented and long-winded, but if I were to just hammer home one point, it's really about like, you know, letting us know at all of these various junctures of your production cycles, like what story are you telling, you know, because that story may change. And as that story changes, we may have additional content to layer and layer and layer and kind of build your projects into something like, again, like profound, which I think is really, really the goal here. Um, archive has such a sort of glorious nature to it. It's like, I sometimes kind of, you know, not to wax poetic, but, you know, I sometimes like riff on like the actual individuals capturing this, like what were their lives like? Like, you know, what was the situation like? And I think it's important to kind of honor that too and to really like respect that and like to respect the content. Again, kind of going back to the offline space, you know, we we very much, you know, have to operate under very, you know, certain rules and parameters, honoring partner editorial policy, things like that. 
So it's it's a wild dance, but it really kind of reinforces, um, you know, the stories you're telling and and how you know impactful they can be, but also the archive itself, like the actual physical piece of media and kind of how that you know how that can be. Forgive my lapse Catholicism term here, but like resurrected, you know, to to have a new life, you know, and kind of have a new con, you know, have just have a new a new forum, a new arena to live in. So I'll shut up now. But <laughs> um, Emma, would you would you add anything to that before we open the floodgates? And f- feel free to be, uh, you know, feel free to complain if you have bugbears about working with filmmakers. Now's the time before I let in all the other bugbears <laughs> from outside. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I, I would agree with Sal that it's um, it's always helpful to know as much about the project as possible. Also, in just in a practical sense, in terms of your timeline, your budget, who you're making the project for, you know, all of these um, bits of context allow us to be more flexible with our prices, to really work with you on making it happen. Maybe we can offer different, you know, upgrade windows, that sort of thing. We can only do that if we know what we're dealing with. So it's having that information up front. And then I guess it's just, um, I suppose a lot of filmmakers might look at archive houses as a sort of stereotype of us, you know, being kind of the enemy, right? That we're the gatekeepers and we're trying to squeeze every penny. And um, actually, you know, behind the frontage, there are humans who are doing a lot of research and working hard on on keeping these archives alive. And actually, once you establish a dialogue, um, you know, it is a more fruitful collaboration and that there is a person putting in real hours of work into trying to help your project. So just keeping that in mind when you engage with the archive think that's that's really well said emma i i would i would have said all of that as well all right well i will uh i will open it up to some of our audience questions um and first one is uh a quite a general one which is maybe a good a place to get started um which is uh, in what ways are these institutions becoming more filmmaker friendly? Um, there was certainly some other comments in the chat from people whose experiences uh, of working with archives have been frustrating and not the the ideals that a lot of you have been talking about. Um, so perhaps you could talk about changes that that have been made or you think still could be made made to to make that relationship more fruitful uh, they in fact say how are you adapting to better support independent filmmakers who don't have big budgets or aren't associated with big production companies which i suppose is is inevitable just to editorialize is inevitably probably less uh profitable uh for the archive and therefore understandably um less of a, a draw on on time and effort um but how do you prevent that becoming impersonal i would you know one thought that comes to mind um is we i work with a lot of filmmakers through the years where again you know budgets are limited and you know we we do have different rights packages that you know that for that particular moment you know that that filmmaker and that production can afford maybe it's just a, a film festival license that affords them the option to kind of go and sell their film and to apply to these festivals and to secure funding so that when distribution you know does happen um hopefully the distributor absorbs some of those like upgrade um, licensing costs so i think that's just something important to keep in mind i i know we always want to kind of um you know opt for the all media including full theatrical um you know, cinema to me is like a cathedral. Again, sorry, la- lapse Catholic comment, but um, the reality is, is that as much as I want documentary films to have like full theatrical runs, the reality, you know, it's probably not going to happen. So, again, I kind of think going back to the communication, like, okay, you know, like, what is your distribution going to be? You know, you're going to try for streaming platforms, but beyond that, like, are you thinking more kind of like a New York, LA theatrical run for a week or two weeks. Like we have bespoke pricing that 
can address some of these like reduced rights packages. I I'm aware that it may not solve everything for every filmmaker. So I want to be sensitive to that because, you know, I'm not here today to be like, you know, yes, we can solve every single pricing solution um, based off of your budget, because I think a lot of the, t you know, this conversation is about like work and effort. I think it's a lot about like return on resources. Like we want to help you. We want to collaborate with you. We want to get as much content, but, you know, we also have a bottom line too, but I think it's important to note that, you know, kind of going back to the flexibility piece, there are different rights um, packages that we, we can potentially offer you um, for that, for that moment in time that, can work within your budget that you know um kind of will help you hopefully sell your sell your film and um, there are a couple of people in the comments um with sort of sp specific uh complaints about uh working mm -hmm. with getty uh w one asks one asked in fact about about what uh, you meant by collaborate and and how that might actually manifest and i think you perhaps just answered that there. Um, so maybe I'll let that person follow up if they have further questions. Um, and in the meantime, uh, a question that, that perhaps is, is more apposite for, for you two, Emma and Ruta, um, because you're more proximate to, to the, the sources often of, of the material that you're licensing. Um, if someone asks, sorry, let me just find it. Uh, they're moving around a bit. Uh, from Jan Sutcliffe, the question is, uh, did archive slash licensing houses ever decline to license footage to a filmmaker? For example, if they're aware that the story or intention of the project isn't in the public good. Um, and there's a similar question um, about whether the public image of the institution in question, say NBC, would ever influence whether something is licensed. We, uh, so Emma, we, perhaps you could start as you talked about um, sometimes going back to the to the source filmmakers and and discussing with them an intended license. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that's obviously a, a real kind of minefield. I mean, we we couldn't really exist if we were kind of trying to pass judgment on everyone's projects about whether or not we felt like the way they were using archive was the correct way to represent that particular image I mean we that's not something we really engage in of course there will be exceptions if we have um just for context obviously any of the clips we're licensing our filmmakers have given us permission to take those clips from their material right so they have already accepted that we are going to be licensing the material so they've kind of given that green light obviously within that there will be nuance um I can't think of a time that we've ever stopped somebody from licensing something but there will be times where maybe we would say oh this is um maybe a project comes to us with a particular political agenda and there are certain clips that we know the filmmaker would be horrified to see their material in that film and we might just maybe say that that's not appropriate but it's um it's a that's a more subtle thing I think you know if there's if there's a film that would have particular sensitivities in terms of the the people represented um then we would be yes there would be times where we might be sensitive about about where we allow that material to go but generally that's being discussed in advance with the people who provided us with the footage and there will be exclusions maybe in terms of territories that are particularly sensitive and that sort of thing um really? We've been asked to provide content for, um, and this is this is a couple of years ago, for a political commercial, and we were we were not going to do that. We were not going to um, participate in in that rhetoric with anything from the collection. Um, and I agree with Emma. We can't possibly check everything, you know, as thoroughly about well, is it going to you know look good, look bad? But when someone says they're doing a political commercial for a particular party and i don't care who it is we're not going to sell footage for that um yeah and sorry no no go ahead no i was just going to say to add to all of this um you know getty does have many types of content many different um partner agreements we do have various like approval processes for certain collections for you know 
particular uses. Um, I will, I think, I know there was a mention of NBC, but I think it's worth clarifying that, you know, our offline product, BBC, NBC, TVNZ, ITN, um, in that we are licensing from like original broadcast archive content, you know, so full program broadcasts, each partner has very, you know, clear rules around editorial policy. So part of the process that we undergo relates to, you know, each partner understanding the context of use and approving or denying that context of use. So, you know, it, and all of that is very much in line with maintaining, you know, um, original context um, as, you know, presenting the content as it aired. So I just want to highlight that because it tends to function very differently than some, than say like pre-vetted stock. I don't like that word, but on the Getty website. So I just wanted to kind of raise that in the um, context of NBC. Um, I'll read uh, out. This is more of a comment than a question, uh, which you don't usually say as the moderator, but in this case, I will. Uh, this is from Mabel, uh, who says, uh, kind of coming back uh, on, on what you were saying, Sal, about um, uh, buying selected territories or um, contexts rather than than all rights. Uh, Mabel says, rights packages aren't sustainable for filmmakers. I believe distributors prefer to buy films that have all the rights for their territories. At the end of the day, it it, it is really to make it, I think, uh, missing word, maybe it is really imperative to make it more financially affordable to filmmakers. Um, this comment is for Getty and similar big commercial houses. Thank you. Um, and I think in in a in a separate question from Mabel, there's a, a sort of related point uh, where she says, "We understand that you need to make a profit, but excessive profit affects the possibility of creating culture." Um, again, that that's more of a comment than a question, but but if you'd like to respond to that in any way. Or yeah, I, I thank you, Mabel, for the feedback. And that's, I think, certainly something from this call we'll, we'll take back to the business. Um, all I can say is, you know, kind of in my day to day, you know, not to like frame out like a plot, but I feel that, you know, we can only move forward, you know, like past experiences that may have been unsavory or sour for any reason as it relates to pricing um, have already occurred in the past. So I, I would really kind of say like, let's move forward with it. And tied to that is let's have a conversation, you know, when you, you know, again, kind of going back to like project communication, um, filmmakers often communicate to me a lot in hypotheticals. Um, but when you, when you are making a film and you are certain that you're gonna need the robust set of rights, let's have a conversation earlier so that we can ensure that you know, the content we are delivering, you know, can be maximized for your particular production. I'm not being deflective here. I totally get it. Like, you know, we need to, you know, we need to kind of address this community and I'm hearing everyone loud and clear. So all I can say is, um, you know, I can take it back to the business. Thank you for the feedback, but I think let's just kind of, um, work from this moment forward and really try to kind of improve the relationship um, that we have with the filmmaking community and, and any kind of, um, again, like sour experience, experience that you've had. Uh, and that's really all we can do, I think at the end of the day, um, but we are very much invested in this community. And I, I, I'm sure I'm speaking for Ruta and Emma here as well. I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but we very much care about filmmakers and films like I know it's about at the end of the day it is about profit but we care about individuals relationships and all the trials and tribulations I think that you go through and in, in the endeavor of making a film um and, and in fact on that you you mentioned earlier forgive me if I just missed this you mentioned that that email address um that people can mm -hmm. contact that goes to those three people 
Shall um, I put it? I can put it in the chat here. Um, that would be great if you don't mind. Um, another question um, for for any of you really, but but perhaps Ruta, I'll start with you um, because I wonder if there's potentially different answers depending on whether you're working within the institution or or without. Um, Jack Silverman asked a question about fair use. Um, and says, what about the ethics of going to an archive, having them research footage, et cetera, with the ahead of time intention of claiming fair use? Um, I, I, don't, I don't, it sounds almost like a, a hypothetical, a sort of um, rhetorical question that, but uh, in general, I suppose, if you could talk about whether there is any role for fair use um, in your interactions with filmmakers or faculty or, or students. Sure. Um in our in our case if we're working with a documentary producer there's we usually uh don't um do fair, fair use uh, and by that i mean when i think of fair use i think of um uh, something that's probably pro bono or that's public domain or or something like that so for us, um, if someone is wanting to use a piece of footage uh, in a production, we are going to charge a fee of some kind. Um, and it could just be a lab fee it, or it could be a licensing fee. It, it really depends on the item that they're, they're interested in. But I, I mean, I think there's this dream and I, I understand it. Uh, I had about wanting to be able to use whatever you want um, that you find. Um, but that's just not a reality for most, most content. At least that's what I think. And I, I mean, Emma and uh, Sal might have something else to say about that. But. Out of interest, do you, uh, do either you or, or Emma um, ever uh, have interactions with filmmakers where you're providing the material like you say perhaps with a lab fee or any other kind of fee but but not directly dealing with the the licensing that they're doing licensing they're coming to you already with the rights or potentially trying to clear the clip under fair use themselves um i think fair use is often a very misunderstood term and often we do have to advise people when they say well my intention is to use this under fair use to say you've misunderstood the parameters of that um as root is saying you know if they come to us saying i want to use this clip from your library my intention is to use it under fair use and it's clearly a piece of historical public domain archive the, but they've come to us because we happen to have it at master quality there will still be a fee of some sort because we still have to go to our archive pull out that clip get the master quality material deliver it to them in whatever format they've requested there's still a cost associated with that it will just be different mm -hmm. to some of our other fees basically oh, that's okay so you, you so that is a something that happens that the people yeah. come Absolutely. to purely for access rather than um, licensing Absolutely, yeah. And were you saying same, Sal? Yeah, so we we do we do have some access only content on our website, but we frequently uh, encounter this in the offline space where we're going through the whole you know uh, rights checks, and it'll come to light that a particular piece of content is third party. Um, we do grant access rights, but as, there's very clear language whereby the licensee is indemnifying um, Getty Images from any future claim. So, mm -hmm. but it's it's a nominal fee that we we apply so that we can, you know, um, provide high res for those particular productions. Um, I will go back to the questions. Um, so th this is uh, this is a question. Uh, from Rachel Morrison that was specifically directed at Emma, but but is perhaps perhaps a, a good thing for you all to to quickly uh, voice, um, which is can you share at some point what your rates are? Um, I don't need you necessarily to start reeling off numbers, um, but if people are looking to uh, 
find the material in your respective archives and find out costs associated? What is the best way for them to go about that in each of your cases? Our, our rates are online. They're on our website. There's a licensing um, tab. And yeah. because, it's, because it's come up a couple of times uh, with respect to different uh, archives, could you also speak to, to how negotiable those rates are, in what contexts they might be negotiable? Yeah, so for us, it, it um, I do negotiate. I, I'll look at what the project is, what the budget is, um, what's needed, that kind of thing. It's that'll be on a it's on a case by case basis. Um, yeah, to answer as well, we we would be similar. Um, there is room for negotiation depending on what the project is. Um, the best way to start a discussion about our rates is to send an email. I think um, our email address has been shared in the chat. It's footage at journeyman.tv. That, that takes you directly to our research team and they will be able to give information that's more bespoke about rates. Um, and you can also just straight away go to our footage website and set up a free account and start accessing clips. So that's something that's always openly accessible to people. But if you want to talk about rates, I would recommend reaching out through our email address. Yeah, I would I would echo that. Um, you know, Getty, because Getty's collections are so vast, um, kind of going back to, you know, working with an individual broadcast sales rep, it's very beneficial to get a, a sense of what particular collections you're going to be licensing from. We have premium archive, you know, we have sport content, it's, it's, it's vast. And I think, you know, some of the um, experiences that people have had have been like going to our website, you know, just utilizing a drop down based off of a certain use. But it's not a one size uh, fits all kind of scenario we definitely apply logic to all of our pricing like for instance in the offline space if if i know a customer is licensing a lot of online materials i will definitely provide them some flexibility in the offline sp space and conversely we we so we really try to kind of like take a, a holistic approach when um addressing pricing yes we do have a kind of baseline rates um and things like that but it sounds like for this group everyone's had a very strong visceral reaction to that. So I would I would definitely kind of engage with us and really work from, again, it kind of is so important to like work from specifics. Like I'm interested in these 20 Getty online assets. Can you let me know what the rates are? Because then we can really work from specifics, um, collection specifics and things of that nature to, you know, again, kind of factor in all of the, various criteria. I wish it were simpler. I'm sorry, but um, it's it's not just because of the amount of collections and partners that we have. Um, I'll ask a, a quick, very specific uh, question, and maybe I'll, I'll pick one of you at random to answer that. And then there's, there's what perhaps could be our final question, because it, I think, points to um, something of a, a new uh, reality for, for archiving uh, mm. work in general. Um, so the specific one, uh, and Emma, maybe you could speak to this, uh, given that the journeyman is is more intimately involved in, in the process of filmmaking as well as uh, archiving. Um, Jack Silberman is asking about uh, story, privacy, and confidentiality. Uh, if a filmmaker is making an investigative documentary regarding a highly sensitive subject, what can be done to guarantee minimum exposure, uh, i.e. only minimal people in the company knowing about the story, uh, et cetera? Um, don't know if that scenario has ever happened uh, to you or if you could speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we deal a lot with investigative journalists, so this is something that we regularly deal with. Um, and we also distribute on behalf of um, broadcasters like the BBC, um, Al Jazeera, who are working on very sensitive projects all the time. So that's something that we as a company are very familiar with. Um, I mean, if you're talking to an archive researcher, I'd say you don't necessarily have to tell them very much about your story. If you have a clear sense of the archive you're looking for, they don't necessarily need to know the context. And if you do need to share more context to find more accurate clips, 
then you know we've signed um non-disclosures and things before in particular cases um if it's something highly sensitive then that's something we can always discuss um so i'd say there's just different ways of handling that but it's it, you know if you're going to a trusted archive that should be something that they're familiar with and um something that they've dealt with before thank you um and then yeah finally and and maybe uh, it would be great to hear from all of you on this um there's a question from uh everett vereen um which is i was wondering if and how new media platforms like youtube uh, or over the top streaming services have affected your respective work as opposed to traditional film and broadcast uh, especially free slash ad supported services as a complete outsider to this world, it seems we're still figuring out exactly how the economies of these services should be run. Um, so I'm, I'm not entirely certain um, whether Everett is asking the question in relation to the licensing of material uh, for work being produced for YouTube and other new media platforms, or uh, in relation to archive being taken from those sources uh, and used in place of what would have traditionally been uh you know brick and mortar archives material um anything that comes to mind in, in response to either of those scenarios would be would be interesting to hear you all talk about and i suppose more generally how the role of the archive is changing in the 21st century Sorry, broad. I know, big, broad. This is the this is the climax yeah. of the panel. This is where we have to. I would just it. yeah. I would just say, from a research and content delivery perspective, many filmmakers source material from you know YouTube, various online sources, but so important to relay that to us as early as possible because again, we I encounter many situations and pickles where that content is in their final edit, it's locked, maybe it has a BBC logo, and everyone just assumes that it's like BBC copyright. Um, and that's where things get really, really sticky and complicated. So it's a great resource. And I know a lot of people do it. And I feel like a lot of filmmakers, just it's like their their initial go to but again, kind of going back to like, project discovery. Um, if you are discovering clips on those various platforms, let us know, like we may have alternate material, we may we may have, you know, other material kind of in line with that, that maybe is just like much easier and, and also perhaps more cost affordable, you know, not in an offline um, product. So it's a challenge, though, it's definitely, it's definitely a challenge. Emma or Ruta, anything, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think I would just urge caution, I suppose. I think, as Al says, you know, it's a, it's a common scenario. But then on the flip side, I think the other side of that question was maybe something about if you're using Archive and then putting it up onto these platforms. Um, they do have very clever technology behind them that allows us to identify when people have done that. So it's, you know, you will get caught, is what I would say. So I would just urge caution, you know, it's, um, I think people are, are rapidly wising up to um, those sorts of platforms being used as um, a resource where people take material from. Um, and also if you do put things up on there, make sure you've got the clearance to do that because um, they have, like I say, they have their means of identifying material that isn't clear, so it does catch up with you, and it's not really worth it. Like Sal says, if you've got to the end point of your project and you haven't factored that in, it can really lead into sticky situations at the what you think is the end of your project. I just, sorry, I'm. I just wanted to chime in here quickly with my own experience in this issue. Uh, people taking things from YouTube or other pre-existing documentaries. Um, I did an archival. Uh, producing workshop, which I dropped the link to um, in the chat a few months ago. And I would just, yeah, reiterate a word of caution in terms of pulling things from the internet without fully knowing where they come from because, or from other documentaries, because uh, oftentimes it you end up spending a lot of time and money trying to figure out where these things actually came from when you're trying to license. Um, and also if you are 
you know, claiming fair use, uh, you should still know where it comes from. Um, uh, or, you know, you'll have to do due diligence, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but also just the value of these archives is that, especially the offline archives, is that they have so much, so many things that haven't been uh, seen before maybe. And so when you pull something from YouTube or from another documentary, you're just pulling someone else's, um, you know, taste or pulling someone else's idea of what's interesting instead of, you know, having the the vast, maybe there's something there that's related that hasn't been seen before. And I think um, just the, 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 the breadth of what these archives has, archives have is something that's, um, a really important, you know, important thing. So um, yeah. that's just my two cents <laughs> as an archival producer. We we also have a rights and clearance team at Getty that sometimes navigates this complexity as well, which is also not easy for them, and they're they're experts at this. So maybe as as one tiny final question, if there's time, um, kind of jumping off from what you were just saying, Gabriella, about because uh, I've experienced that exact same thing where you start seeing the same archival clips in multiple documentaries that don't even seem necessarily like particularly great clips, but clearly either they're being pulled from those other documentaries or they're the ones that are on YouTube that people are finding when they type whatever relevant phrase into the search bar. Um, the flip side of that obviously is, is that it's sort of demonstrative of how effective platforms like YouTube are at spreading this material and, and popularizing archive material and and increasingly obviously you know we've all seen bits of archive go viral at, at seemingly random times because it catches people unawares or it, you know chimes with the present day in some particular reason some particular way um i wonder if as a final thought any of you or, or maybe Ruta, as you didn't speak to that last question could speak about about how your efforts or methods of spreading awareness and and consciousness of the archive have shifted in the in the digital age and whether much as you're dealing with a much broader array of material than, than what one might find by searching for you know the various themes collected in your collections on youtube um there could be an upside to that channel of distribution yeah it's interesting because we've we've gone with um portals you know we've got we're part of a civil rights digital portal we're a part of the american archive of public broadcasting we've got stuff in the digital public library of america so we we definitely have stuff through these portals but what i've found is that filmmakers are finding content that someone will take from our site and put on youtube and it's also one of the reasons we put a watermark on our stuff because then the, the, the person who's interested in it can find us again. So we're finding this more and more. And at times it's frustrating because then I have to find out exactly where that item lives because someone's just decided to grab it, maybe do a little description, but they don't say where they got it from or what the unique ID is or anything. So um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, space to be in. On the one hand, I'm really happy that stuff is being found and that people are using it. But, but like, for instance, it, um, this week, we're searching for an African-American golfer from 1974 who played in an LPGA tournament um, in Atlanta. And I didn't know anything about this golfer, but they're doing a documentary on her. And I, I'm, I'm thrilled. But they're looking for this content they found on YouTube. And I'm having a heck of a time finding it in our collection. <laughs> but I did find some other stuff. There you go. The, the images are a little bit free and a little bit captive at the same yeah. time. It's it's interesting. Um, I think on that note, uh, we will draw to a close as we have reached half past. Um, but thank you all so much for, for taking part um, and to all of you watching uh, around the world, wherever you are. Thank you to Gabriella and our uh, accessibility helpers today. Um, it's been a pleasure. Do we need to say anything else in particular, Gabriella, to, to mm -hmm. give people 
a takeaway, something no. an actionable event? <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I I don't have any uh, profound closing words. <laughs> But thank you so much to everybody for being here and uh, participating in this, um, I think, important conversation. Hopefully, it's one of, of many more. Um, and I hope everyone has taken something away from it. And thank you, Charlie, for doing a wonderful job moderating. Um, and I am, uh, remember, uh, check out our website, documentary.org, for upcoming events. And uh, Remember that you can get a Getty discount for uh, being an IDA member. And um, I will download the chat and send it to all of the registrants so you have the contact information of uh, all of the institutions here. So thank you so much, Salvatore and Emma and Ruta and Charlie. This has been so wonderful. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.